Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International District Energy Association webinar series. Uh, this is the second webinar in a three-part series. Uh, my name is Rob Thornton. I'm the president and CEO of IDA, and I'll be serving as moderator for today's webinar, uh, which is entitled Incorporating Absorption Technology in District Cooling and Heating. Uh, before we begin, before I introduce our presenter for the day, just uh, some housekeeping. Um, we had over 600 registrants for this webinar, so therefore uh, you're, you'll all be muted. Um, we didn't want to open the uh, phone lines for uh, that sort of cacophony. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be available to all participants, whether you actually are on hand or just registered. Uh, so it will be available both as a streaming content, so you can uh, you know, uh, kind of replay it at your convenience, and also the slides will be available in a PDF format to all registrants. You'll, you will receive a link shortly after the webinar is closed uh, to both of those platforms. Uh, you can, uh, and we would ask if you're so inclined to share it with your colleagues uh, or clients uh, or people that may also be interested. Uh, additionally, at the end of the webinar, there will be a brief survey, uh, and we would appreciate any feedback, your comments, both on the, the content and delivery of today's webinar, as well as, if you have ideas, feedback for future topics. We're always interested in that. Um, a shameless plug for IDEA, our upcoming conferences on your calendar. December 9 through 11 will be in Dubai, UAE for Efficient Energy for Smartest Cities, and the registration is open and available. We've assembled really, I think, a terrific technical program. I hope you'll make, make plans to join us in Dubai. Um, you can find that information on our website, districtenergy.org. Then in February, we'll be join, uh, convening in New Orleans, uh, February 26th through March 1st for the 32nd annual this Energy Conference uh, 2019, always a uh, stellar event, and this year looks like uh, will be exceptional. Uh, but my, my, I would urge you to uh, register early, uh, book your hotel. We're in New Orleans the week before Mardi Gras, uh, so it'll be, I think, a busy uh, educational and maybe even a festive event. So please visit our website for that, and then. In June next year, we'll be in, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for our 110th annual conference, IDA 2019, entitled The Energy for More Resilient Cities. And uh, if, um, if you may be well aware that Pittsburgh is really redefining themselves with a focus on more resilient energy infrastructure. So we're looking forward to a very large uh, event in Pittsburgh with a strong emphasis on microgrids, of course, district energy, and combined heat and power. So please visit www.districtenergy.org for more information on, uh, on those upcoming conferences. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Rajesh Dixit. Rajesh is a uh, chemical engineer with, uh, with also uh, his master's in business administration, an MBA, and uh, 27 years, really, I think, of direct industry experience, really uh, focused experience. He is director of global product management for thermally driven chillers and heat pumps at Johnson Controls at their headquarters in York, Pennsylvania. So it's my pleasure to turn, uh, turn it over to Rajesh uh, and uh, he's got a lot of content. Uh, again, a housekeeping item. We're going we're gonna to conserve uh, questions for the end. Uh, and if you would be so kind, uh, again, enter your questions uh, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen where it says Q&A. We'll, we'll be receiving the questions uh, you know, chronologically, and we'll try to make as much time as we can available. I, we are planning to conclude the webinar at 2.15 p.m. so we can run a little long. But please uh, submit your questions as they come to you, uh, and we'll do our best to, uh, to respond at the conclusion of the, the formal presentation. Uh, and, and as well, Rajesh and the team at York will be available for follow-up, and uh, we'll make sure you know how to contact them. So Rajesh, uh, please take it away. 
Thanks very much, Rob, uh, for the introduction and moderating this uh, webinar. Thanks to uh, Cheryl Jacks and the entire uh, IDA team for hosting it. I truly appreciate it. So hi everyone, this is uh, Rajesh calling in from York, Pennsylvania, Johnson Controls. Similar to uh, what I said during the last webinar, we are doing this particular webinar because there is a new appreciation in the value of heat. The earlier webinar from last month was about busting the myths of the lithium bromide water-based absorption cooling technology. Hopefully, um, we clarified many things and proved that the absorption technology is not some sort of a black magic or some sort of a hypnotism. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> this particular webinar is uh, focused on real-world case studies. Uh, deploying the absorption cooling and heat pump technology for district cooling and district heating applications. My goal really today is to provide you with an overview of uh, this large or what we call as the super large um, district cooling heating application. So without taking uh, too much time there, uh, let's begin. This, uh, as I clarified before, this webinar is not about uh, basics of absorption chillers. However, let us quickly review uh, the four main components of the unit so that we can have a better appreciation of the slides that are going to follow. You are seeing the four uh, main components of an absorber, uh, absorption chiller, the evaporator, the absorber, the condenser, and the generator. The unit itself uh, operates uh, under vacuum and water, yes, I mean, uh, uh, water indeed is the refrigerant. Lithium bromide is the absorbent. And uh, lithium bromide is nothing but, frankly, a simple salt, similar in properties to our uh, common, common table salt. <clears throat> Some sort of a driving heat source is uh, put in the generator section. Uh, example, low or medium or high pressure steam. Uh, the steam has to be uh, saturated, though. Uh, the driving heat source could also be hot water, let us say, from the jacket of a reciprocating gas engine of a CHP system, or hot water from an industri industrial process. There are many regions in the world, such as Middle East and North America, uh, where it is also, or Japan for that matter, uh, I mean, there are many, many places in the world where it is very common to fire uh, natural gas or light oil. <clears throat> Uh, you could also have a renewable resource such as hot water from a, a solar thermal collector. But frankly, I haven't really seen many of those applications. I mean, uh, using hot water from solar. The cooling uh, or the condenser water is uh, passed through the absorber section to keep that you know lithium bromide nice and cool. Uh, the cooling or the condenser water then uh, continues its journey to the condenser section where it helps to condense the refrigerant vapor, uh, which is then uh, converted to liquid st state and is fed back into the evaporator section. So the liquid refrigerant in the evaporator takes the heat away from the chill water, and which is why our chill water uh, reduces its temperature from uh, 54 degrees, uh, 12 degrees Celsius to 44 Fahrenheit, 7 degrees Celsius typically. So the liquid refrigerant turns into water vapor and is absorbed by the concentrated lithium bromide solution in the absorber section. The concentrated solution, because it absorbs the water vapor, becomes weaker or diluted. And therefore, this uh, diluted solution is, uh, uh, you know, transported from the absorber section to the generator section with the help of a very small pump. And is heated in the generator section to become concentrated again. And frankly, the cycle keeps uh, going. <clears throat> How it works, you know, we can talk for hours or half a day at least, uh, but I just wanted to provide you with a quick description of how it works in the cooling mode. To summarize, uh, you got four simple shell and tube heat exchangers. The unit itself is driven by waste heat or some sort of a low cost heat, such as gas or oil, and yes, water as the refrigerant. So truly, truly green solution. And once again, the unit operates under uh, you know, vacuum way below atmospheric pressure. 
So this might actually seem uh, very basic to uh, some of you on this call, but then uh, you will appreciate when I go to the next slide. This is heat pump. So the same unit now being applied as a heat pump, where the purpose is to produce heating water, very high temperature heating water from the condenser section. As you can see, the unit is still driven by the waste heat in the generator section. And this uh, waste uh, uh, driving heat source is at a high level or higher grade heat, I should say. <clears throat> then we are also putting some sort of a low grade uh, waste heat source in the evaporator section, such as water from a cooling tower, the water which otherwise would have gone to the cooling tower and uh, rejected the heat. Instead, uh, we divert some of that water and put it into the evaporator section. This water, as you know, typically is around uh, 85 degrees Celsius or approximately 85 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, or 30 degrees Celsius. So we are putting uh, two heat sources into the unit, right? We are feeding heat in the generator and the evaporator section. This particular heat is going to get rejected to the fluid passing through the absorber and the condenser section. By doing so, as is shown on the slide, you can get almost 194F or 90 degrees Celsius from the condenser section. And this heating water or hot water can be used for a variety of applications, such as district heating or process heating, which we will see very soon. So I've already talked enough about the uh, benefits of the technology being driven by waste heat and water as the refrigerant. Let us basically now explore how these benefits can be unlocked or have been unlocked into real world applications, delivering resilient and clean cooling or for that matter, clean heating. So <clears throat> let's take in the uh, beauty of this technology, I would, as I would say. I just want to clarify something that, uh, you know, I won't be able to provide uh, actual customer names or uh, job site details in this particular webinar uh, because we got to respect the uh, privacy of our customers and also, you know, respect their confidential information. What I can assure you is that each and every case study that I'm go going to present is a real one. Okay, it's a real life operating installation. So let's start with this first one. It's a 22,500 tons of cooling. It has been in operation since almost year 2000. There are seven chillers, as you can see. Um, all seven of them are absorption chillers. Steam driven. The plant provides chill water and steam to an area surrounding almost uh, uh, 3 million square feet, or let's say uh, about 275,000 square meters of space. I realize that you know there are some folks who are more comfortable with square meters. 3 million square feet or 275,000 square meters. The electricity is generated by a gas turbine that provides electricity for chillers and the pumps, etc., in the plant. And the surplus and the surplus electricity is sold through the power grid. The exhaust gases from the gas turbine are fed into a waste heat recovery boiler to produce steam at about 8 bar or 115 pounds. There are gas-fired boilers uh, too. So the steam uh, from all of these boilers uh, dry the uh, seven absorption chillers I mentioned before. As is shown on the slide, three of these chillers are um, each of 5,000 tons capacity. And the reason I highlight that is because uh, 5,000 5, tons from a single unit is the largest capacity uh, for a single unit ever as far as at least I know. I could be wrong. 
So this was our um, first installation, okay? Gas turbine, VST recovery boilers, gas fired boilers, and all of the steam. Uh, during winter time, the steam is used for heating, and then during summer time, as you can imagine, uh, the steam is used uh, for driving absorption chillers for, you know, producing chill water for comfort cooling. Okay, I'm purposely taking a pause so that you have some time to look at the slides. Let's move on to the next one. This one is a 17,000 cooling ton system and it has been in existence since 1998. It cools um, surrounding buildings and a major uh, subway station. There are a total of uh, 10 chillers. Eight of them are absorption and two of them are electric centrifugal type. The absorbers uh, are driven by eight bar steam pressure, 115 pounds from the gas fired boilers. Okay, so there is no gas turbine or a waste heat recovery boiler. It's a simple um, gas fired boiler producing steam for heating during winter time and steam for cooling during the summer time. And it's a hybrid system. The absorption and the centrifugal chillers are working in parallel. So depending upon the time of the day, uh, <clears throat> the right type and the right number of chillers are operated to keep the operational cost to the uh, optimum level. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So it's going to get uh, more complex, or rather I should say, you know, we are getting more and more into uh, hybrid systems. So this system has uh, steam-driven um, absorbers, electric centrifugal chillers, and chill water storage tank. This plant uh, provides chill water and steam to various uh, commercial buildings, hotels, um, office buildings, and has been in operation since uh, 1997. Delivers about 8,250 cooling tons. What I found interesting about this uh, schematic was that there was a uh, chill water storage tank almost 2200 meter cube or 600,000 gallons. And you'll be surprised as well that this particular chill water storage tank is used for providing water for daily use or even for firefighting in case of emergencies. As you know, Japan as a nation is prone to earthquakes. So, you know, there are multiple benefits of this uh, chill water uh, storage tank. <clears throat> Why chill water storage as opposed to ice thermal storage? Because chill water storage, storage is cheaper than ice thermal storage in Japan. Anyway, so the chill water storage is typically at uh, uh, four degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit. So it's getting bigger and bigger, more and more complex. Sixty-one thousand tons of cooling. Sixty-one thousand. Lots of steam turbine chillers, steam turbine centrifugal chillers that are driven by steam. That is almost at five hundred and sixty-five pounds. This is a very, very famous installation in a very high-end suburb of Tokyo in Japan. Once again, I could be wrong, but as far as you know, I know this is probably the world's largest district cooling plant for thermally driven chillers. It has been in operation since 1991. And as you can see, uh, that the system has a gas turbine uh, or gas turbines uh, producing on-site electrical power 
and the waste exhaust gases from these turbines are recovered to produce high pressure steam. In addition, we also have gas fired boilers. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, there are many uh, steam turbine centrifugal chillers. You will also notice something interesting that there is an absorption chiller that is downstream of the steam turbine chiller. And this particular absorption chiller is driven by steam at approximately 40 pounds. Is the steam that is exiting from the steam turbine chiller. This is called as the turbo topping or turbo absorption. The electric power generated by the gas turbine is used for powering the chillers and the pumps, etc., in the plant room and is supplied to the uh, government buildings through dedicated power cable. Um, basically, in order to continue supplying electric power in case of uh, emergencies. So, 61,000 tons of cooling. Moving on, um, this one is 20,000 tons. Hybrid cooling system, uh, it, it has been uh, in operation since 1995. So in the picture, just to keep things you know, clear, and um, I, I wanted to make sure that I include the schematics. You are seeing only one plant in the picture, but in reality, there are three such plants. Uh, they serve a huge area, almost uh, uh, 3 million, uh, uh, 3 million meter, meter square, which is about 30 million square feet. Interesting thing to note here, and this came up also during the IDEA microgrid conference in Baltimore uh, <clears throat> earlier this week, which by the way was a great conference. Interesting thing to note here is that the municipal waste is burned uh, to produce steam, which is converted to hot water for heating purpose in winter. Okay. So the same um, steam is used as a driving heat source for the absorbers during the summertime. Main goal is to save uh, primary energy, which is basically natural gas consumption and cut down on CO2 emissions. On the previous slide, we talked about the chill water storage tank, right? In this particular case, um, it is the ice thermal storage system. I'll give you a minute to look at it. Uh, while you're looking at the slide and taking it in, what I was surprised to know that the ice thermal storage system and the electric centrifugal chillers are the base load equipment and the steam fired absorber or absorbers are used for peak load during summertime. Maybe I can elaborate a little bit further on this slide. As you can see the return chill water at 14 degrees Celsius, right? The one on the bottom right. The return water at 14 degrees Celsius or 57, 57F is fed into the ice storage tank first uh, and then flows into each chiller in parallel, the centrifugal and the absorber. Uh, the brine chiller, uh, 2400 tons, uh, operates during the night time for ice storage uh, because electric utility cost is cheaper in the night time. In the morning, Chill water is supplied to the um, or by the ice storage tank. And if the cooling demand increases and chill water temperature is not maintained at 7 degrees Celsius, 44F, then the 800 tons and 3000 tons centrifugal chiller is started first. If the cooling demand continues to increase further, then the absorption chiller comes on. Next one, um, 
It's not so big, it's 6,600 tons. But the interesting thing is this particular um, plant also has a mix of natural gas and electricity. Uh, it supplies uh, chill water, hot water, and steam to about um, 70,000 uh, square meter space or 750,000 square feet. And it's been operational since uh, six years. What I find interesting here is that, uh, unlike the previous slides where most of the slides had, you know, <clears throat> the uh, steam driven uh, chillers, right? So in this case, uh, the absorption chiller is a natural gas direct fire type. There are other uh, few special things about this particular uh, installation. Recycled um, sewage water. Recycled sewage water is used as the cooling or the condenser water and also as the low temperature waste heat source for the centrifugal heat pump. So it also has a gas engine based cogen or a CHP system. So in a reciprocating gas engine, you know, you got a lot of heat in the jacket of the engine. So the waste heat from the jacket of the engine from the CHP system is actually utilized as a driving heat source and fed into the chiller that you see on the slide that says Gini Link. And what is that? Gini Link is a multi energy chiller that is generally a direct gas fired chiller. So the base chiller is a direct gas fired, but it can also take hot water as a supplemental driving heat source from the jacket of the gas engine. It's a combination gas direct fire plus hot water driven chiller. Once again, um, this particular installation does have the chill water storage tank, which as I mentioned before, can be used as water for day-to-day -day use or firefighting in case of um, emergencies or natural disasters. This particular slide seems like a very simple slide, a uh, single effect hot water driven absorption chiller, but it is very, very popular these days. I did not mention, but the capacity of each chiller is about 500 tons. And it is recovering the jacket water heat from a GE and Bakker gas engine that provides 221 degrees driving hot water into the chiller. The chiller takes up this heat and returns that water at 167. So 221 F, 167 F is your delta T across the uh, hot water loop. The chiller provides uh, 43 degree Fahrenheit or 6 degree Celsius chill water. Um, that is used for uh, cooling of a very uh, large and famous university in Germany. It's a CHP system, so you got an electrical output. Uh, I'm told that the gas engine has a, a electrical efficiency of approximately 43%. And then um, the thermal component, right, the heat from the jacket of the engine also approximately almost uh, 39 to 41 percent, all of that is also recovered and fed into absorption chillers. And therefore, the combined uh, system efficiency jumps to almost 85 percent. So it's a very, very simple system, extremely rel reliable. The chiller used is a very simple one, is a single stage. Uh, hot water chiller. Okay, so continuing with another great CHP application. Once again, using the gas engine waste heat and delivering chill water for comfort cooling as well as industrial process air conditioning. You can see the fancy uh, picture on the slide. 
uh, I cannot name the end user, but all I can say is a very, very high tech leading manufacturer of uh, future generation cars. Um, leading the world in terms of automated driving. The chill water uh, being produced by the absorber is at uh, 8 degrees Celsius, 46 and a half Fahrenheit. And, uh, you know, the jacket water temperature profile is a little bit different than the previous slide. In this case, is uh, 230F, 158, 158F. Notice the 158, right? Few years ago, absorption chillers couldn't be designed or made to work with such a large delta T on the hot water and with particularly low leaving temperatures as low as 158. But now that barrier has been overcome and the chiller could be driven with such a large delta T. So frankly, you know, I mean, uh, when you look at such applications, I mean, you have no choice but to really fall in love with the uh, absorption, uh, absorption technology. So, so far, we have discovered and explored and uh, reviewed cooling applications, district cooling applications. Now we're going to switch to heating, okay? So this slide um, shows an application that is fast growing and what we call as district heating application. Oh, uh, I just realized something that um, I should have included English units. Um, it's all in metric, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'll try to do my best, as, at least when I speak, um, that I, I talk about both units. Sorry about that. So the unit is uh, driven by steam, which is extracted from the port of a steam turbine power steam turbine producing electric power. You can see that the steam being extracted is at uh, 0.5 megapascal or 5 bar or 75 PSIG. On the bottom right, you can see that the water from the cooling tower is diverted and fed into the evaporator section. This water is entering at uh, 45 Celsius, which is about 115 Fahrenheit, and leaves from the evaporator at 40 Celsius, uh, which is about 105 Fahrenheit. Um, sorry for taking pauses there. I was doing some quick mental, mental conversions. Uh, you'll also notice that the return water from the district heating loop is at 50 Celsius, 120F, and what you get eventually is what you're looking for is the supply water for district heating at 90 Celsius, which I know is 194 Fahrenheit because I use that number a lot. Okay, so the unit is driven by steam, which is extracted from the steam turbine, which is my high grade driving heat source. I'm feeding into the unit low temperature waste heat source, which is the water diverted from the cooling tower. So now I'm saving on water also because I'm not evaporating as much in the cooling tower. And in return, I get that 90 degrees Celsius or 194F uh, which is very, very commonly used for district heating. So what this does is, um, eventually what it does is, uh, it allows you to serve a larger heating area and allows you to use uh, less primary energy. This particular application is from China where um, most of the Chinese thermal power plants are coal-fired. So it serves the goal, it meets the goal of burning less coal in the boiler, and burning less coal in the boiler means less emissions and less particulate matter, and that is exactly uh, 
the goal of deploying the absorption heat pump to improve the air quality by reducing the emissions. Emissions are reduced by burning less coal. Less coal is burned because of this unique absorption heat pump technology. Uh, this is a real um, real life case study and uh, all the temperatures uh, and pressures that you see are from a real world plant. It's a job in China. So thermal power plant, you got two units, each of 14 megawatt, delivering a total of 28 megawatts of heating capacity. Okay. The thermal power plant is coal fired, as I mentioned before, the goal is to use less coal and therefore cut on emissions. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in China, you know, many a times, or almost most of the times, the thermal power plant company is also responsible, or rather mandated, for providing electricity, obviously, but also for heating water to various homes during the winter time. All the uh, numbers are already there on the slide, so uh, I won't read out every single value. The important thing is uh, that the driving heat source in the generator is approximately, well, it is uh, 8,197 kilowatts of heat, driving heat. And then the evaporator, you are feeding 5,980 kilowatts. And therefore, 8197 plus 5980, you get 14177 kilowatt, which is what you get from the condenser. So you divide the um, 14177 kilowatt, the heating output, right, by the driving heat source, which is 8197, you get a heating COP of 1.73. And that is very typical of absorption heat pumps you will see heating COPs of around 1.7. What I've always been uh, amazed is uh, that the paybacks are very fast. I mean, uh, in this particular case, I wrote one year payback, but in reality, in many of the installations, the payback is six months or eight months. Huge amount of uh, coal is saved, huge amount of carbon dioxide is avoided. And the annual heating hours are very less, right? I mean, um, as, I, as far as I know, the heat pumps uh, are, you know, commissioned or recommissioned uh, in the month of October, and then they kind of run until, uh, you know, February, March, during the winter time. So the heating COP of 1.73 is, uh, is very high if you compare it to a boiler. Even if you take the world's most efficient boiler, 100%, the COP is going to be only 1.0. Compared to that, the COP is 1.73. And this is the reason why the economic payback is so quick. Okay. Um, there's one more benefit. We are also saving huge amount of water. And you know the connection between water and energy is very, very close. How are we saving water? because we are diverting water away from the cooling tower and feeding that into the evaporator section, okay? So thermal power plant, any thermal power plant has lots of cooling towers. So some of the water, I'm not saying all of the water, but some of the water is diverted away and fed into the evaporator. So, so there is less evaporation loss in the cooling tower. So overall, um, this is a uh, very fast emerging application. <clears throat> Seems very simple and straightforward. I would say, you know, equally very impressive uh, uh, as a real-world application for district heating. Next one um, is not a thermal power plant, is a customer, is a chemical factory. Uh, this was a learning for me also that even a private customer like a chemical factory 
uh, can also uh, contribute towards supplying the district heating water. Uh, I guess maybe you know this is uh, quite common in China, but something new that I learned. In this particular application, you got three units, each of um, 16 megawatts heating capacity. So total heating is about 48 megawatts. And once again, the COP is almost close to 1.7. The unit is driven by 100 pound steam. Uh, and this steam is, uh, this steam is excess steam that already exists in the chemical factory. Okay, the chemical factory already has cooling towers. So you divert the water away from the cooling tower and feed it into the evaporator as we have been saying. And in return, you get 154 Fahrenheit heating water that is used for district heating. Now, this uh, water leaving the condenser doesn't have to be necessarily used only for district heating. It can also be used for process heating. Uh, one common application would be, if I may go to the previous slide, um, I should have maybe mentioned that. So back to our previous slide, thermal power plant. This water leaving the condenser in this particular case is only 167, but in certain cases it could be 90 Celsius or 194F. A very common application would be to take that heating water from the condenser and preheat the boiler feed water, okay? Preheat the boiler feed water. And many different kinds of industries, for example, chocolate manufacturing has, um, you know, the need for taking that heating water for the chocolate manufacturing process as such, uh, for the chocolate pulp, or you could also use that heating water to preheat the boiler feed water that is in the cho chocolate factory. It can be chocolate, it can be automotive, it can be textile. A uh, variety of possibilities exist. So once again, uh, the payback is uh, pretty quick, uh, about one year. And ultimately, the goal is to cut down on primary energy. This slide, uh, <laughs> this slide I inserted at the last minute. I was not sure, but I thought, you know, I'll give a little bit of a different angle. Because after all, uh, well, this is a biomass based system. So biomass qualifies as a renewable source of energy. So biomass uh, boilers are, you know, uh, utilized to produce very high temperature hot water that goes to various homes uh, during winter time. This is very common in um, several European countries. So the very first bullet, um, you know, uh, it says that the water from the biomass boiler is almost at 170 Celsius, 338 Fahrenheit. The picture is of a um, real world installation in, uh, in Netherlands. In Netherlands or in uh, many Scandinavian countries, there is a regulation that the exhaust gases from the biomass boilers must be cooled down below a certain temperature, which I think it is uh, 50 Celsius or 120F. So how do you cool the flue gases? You basically cool the flue gases using the uh, water leaving from the evaporator of the absorp absorption heat pump unit. So the water from the evaporator uh, cools the flue gases or the exhaust gases exiting from the biomass fired boiler. So now this water, let's not call it chill water, you know, because uh, this water is at a pretty high temperature. Let's call it a, as a low temperature waste heat source. So in the second bullet, you can see that this particular uh, water in and out of the evaporator of the absorption heat pump is uh, 49 Celsius in 
outlet 40 Celsius. Okay. In Fahrenheit is 120 in, 104 out. The driving heat source for the absorption heat pump itself is the uh, high temperature hot water, which is the 170 Celsius 338F from the biomass boiler. Okay. So in return, what you get is um, um, 88 degrees Celsius 190F water, which is used for uh, district heating. Basically, it goes to approximately 100,000 homes. And once again, we are saving huge amount of primary energy as well as cutting down on emissions. Uh, the total heating capacity is 15 megawatts and the COP is uh, 1.67. Uh, the payback is uh, two years, not one year, but I would say two years is uh, still very good. We are almost on to our uh, last slide. Uh, this is, uh, as you can tell from the picture, this is not absorption at all, right? So what is this? So this is a centrifugal compressor-based heat pump. I thought of including this because it is thermally driven. And um, what it has is, uh, it has a steam turbine uh, with a single shaft spinning two compressors. It uh, delivers almost 100 megawatts, 100 megawatts of heating capacity from one single unit, ideally suited for district heating. To get 100 megawatts from one single unit is very impressive, something that absorption heat pump cannot do. Typically, absorption heat pumps go up to 30, 40 megawatts from one unit. 100 megawatts from one unit is impossible. So this unit can work with, um, with very high uh, steam pressures uh, compared to absorption. However, it does have some limitations in terms of how high the temperature you can get from the uh, eventual temperature that you can get from the condenser section. I just wanted to at least mention about this technology that it is out there. And uh, today is not the focus of this technology. We can talk about it separately some other time. Um, I would say that, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages of absorption versus this technology, as is the case in any other technology. So anyway, the steam turbine driven centrifugal heat pump has its own niche, and particularly it does very well when you want to have 100 megawatts from one unit, because in many countries like China, for example, it is common to have a uh, application or an installation that requires, let's say, 300 megawatts of heating then maybe you are better off probably, you know, providing three of these bigger units, 100 megawatt each. But that is not to say that absorption heat pump is also ideally suited to 300 megawatt application, except that the number of units will be uh, more, but at the same time absorption can deliver higher temperature from the condenser than this steam turbine driven centrifugal heat pump. Okay. So we are on to our uh, last slide uh, before we get into Q&A. So once again, um, I will not repeat myself. I think we have talked a lot about the benefits. I would say that, you know, don't waste those uh, BTUs. Don't waste the waste heat. So we should, uh, we should love each and every BTU or kilowatt for those not in North America. We should be very, very, very positive about every single BTU. You know, repurpose the energy as much as you can. 
because this uh, one hour webinar uh, frankly i can take you uh, much deeper into this technology uh, but we have limited time today point is that uh, there are endless possibilities with this uh, i mean uh, thrilling ascending technology so what i would say there is that uh, let us not allow for this uh, technology to be overlooked anymore okay maybe one more thing um, i would also like to thank uh, uchida san from our joint venture company uh, johnson control sitachi uh, located in japan he was of great help i would say i was a pain asking him too many questions uh, on various schematics and why chill water storage tank why not ice thermal storage etc so he spent a lot of time with me so that's it folks basically you know um, once again uh, thank you so much for attending this webinar sponsored by the idea and moderated by its president mr rob thornton once again thanks to uh, cheryl jacks and the entire idea team at this time uh, i would like to hand it over to rob for moderating um, questions and answers and thanks again thanks very much great job rajesh thank you very much um so um i'm going to roll back through the questions we had the first one uh was i think really related to a larger sort of um uh training and uh, uh mr shaw idea will get back to you on uh, on really the question of training uh for the industry uh first question rajesh is how can we use the hot water produced for smaller installations not just district cooling do you do you see kind of a a sweet spot or a break point below which um you know m maybe this technology doesn't make economic sense yeah that's a great question um i would yeah. see that uh while we talked about uh, large applications um 10 20 30 40 megawatts i would see that uh, generally uh, 1 megawatt and above would 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 be more uh, economical and would make more sense uh, i would say definitely stay above uh 750000 kilowatts yes yes so one megawatt well, and and, and, I, and i guess i would add too that uh, you know uh, to the questioner i mean this uh, webinar was really about the uh uh application of absorptions in district heating and cooling where the international district energy association so you know that is kind of the framework that we're working in not necessarily sort of single building applications but um uh so you may want to circle back with rajesh uh, more directly um uh for maybe a smaller applications next question uh rajesh was um why charge alcohol in absorption chiller with lithium bromide i think there's a question about sort of the working fluids is um and uh, i don't know that i understand the context of this but it it had to do with uh you know i guess the working fluids in in absorber why charge that's alcohol my, that's my favorite question by the way <laughs> um, <laughs> so we got water and uh, refrigerant water and lithium bromide the alcohol that is being charged is a uh, alcohol called octyl alcohol and um the most significant part of the chiller is the absorber section where the lithium bromide is sprayed on top of the absorber tubes and inside of the tubes you have cooling of the condenser water flowing from the cooling tower so there is that film of uh, lithium bromide that surrounds the absorber tube Mm -hmm. now the now the inner uh, inner film is in contact with the wall of the tube so it is cooler than the outside of that film but you want uniform temperature of that lithium bromide film on top of the absorber tube yeah so by adding alcohol what happens is that there is a turbulence created in that film on top of that absorber tube so that film has a back and forth movement you can't see but it is there and therefore right. then, um, uh because of the turbulence it is uh, you know making a good job of absorption a uh, one word so to enhance the heat transfer then right yeah increase the wettability of the lithium bromide yeah 
I one, see. Oh. One, one quick clarification. Uh, adding octal alcohol does increase the capacity of the unit by approximately 10%. Uh, but if you add too much, then instead of increasing the capacity, it will go down because the alcohol will start to interfere with the boiling of the refrigerant. I have so, the same conditions. There's a certain <laughs> uh, number of alcohol I can consume, and then after that, my performance goes way off. Absolutely. So up that to was two a bad, bad aside. Going. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, shouldn't that, shouldn't try for levity uh, in a in a webinar. Um, Next question, uh, and, and I, this is one I often have, Rajesh. So absorbers, it, he saw this uh, the question I saw in your um, in your slides that uh, the supply temperature is, is often 44 degrees F. Um, is there an issue with uh, using absorbers in uh, parallel or or in series with electric chillers because you're really desired uh, send out is 42 F? How, how, how would you sort of uh, how would you kind of recommend applications here? Okay, so a few things in that question. So one thing is uh, 44 is just uh, representative, but 42 is also very common and doable, no no problem, or even okay. 40 degrees, even 40 degrees. Now, um, you know, this is a non-commercial webinar, so all, all I can say there is that uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are a couple of manufacturers uh, that can now go down to even 32F or 23F. Um, I see. So all, all those barriers have been overcome. Now, it is very common for an absorber to be piped in parallel to an electric centrifugal, but there are also some applications where I've seen that the absorption chiller is piped upstream uh, or downstream of the centrifugal chiller. It depends on the application, but when, whenever you have a series system, Yes. One thing to remember is that you have a very large flow, so the pressure drop is very high. Yes. But, but it's and, possible. I mean, yeah. Uh, so that's interesting because it, it does. I guess it seems then that you uh, you know the mythology that absorbers can only deliver at a at a certain temperature, sort of you know kind of a higher band of desired temperature. Um, you say the technology has uh, has really moved beyond that now, so you can get lower temperatures, particularly in district cooling in I think uh, uh, you know humid climates where you know lower temperature is is pretty important. If certainly if you're supplying like a larger thermal grid too. Right. So, four degrees Celsius, forty Fahrenheit is no problem. Okay. Well, that's that's encouraging. Um, what, uh, next question is, and I think this related uh, back to the uh, uh, heat pump application uh, and and heat delivery. So, what is the maximum outlet temperature one can get out of uh, the, the sort of heat pump uh, uh, application? Uh, so, high temperature send out. Right, high temperature send out, yeah. And uh, the, the the answer is 95 degrees Celsius, which is... Uh, is that like 200 uh, degrees F? Yeah, 203F. 203F, but, yeah. But 95 degrees Celsius, 203F um, is, you know, dependent upon a few things. What is the leaving evaporator temperature that is desired? and what is the entering absorber temperature. So leaving evaporator and entering absorber decides how much you can get from the leaving condenser. I see, okay. I see, that makes sense. Uh, but uh, in, a, in a district heating application, you know, 200F is quite, a, quite adequate for uh, kind of what are now sort of third generation, um, you know, it's certainly short of, of steam, but um, but really would be more than adequate in a third or, or even fourth generation district heating application. Um, right. Another question we had, and I, I think this is, is more related, I don't know if it's related to, uh, you know, kind of the equipment in the, in, the, in the unit or relative to the district heating distribution network. So the question is, is steel the only material you can use for heat district cooling? Um, so, to the questioner, if, if that's related to, uh, you know, the question is related to the distribution network, you know, the uh, heating supply in return, steel is is not the only material you can use. You can, you know, HDPE, different um, 
uh, different you know methods of, of tubing, ductile iron. There are a wide range of applications on the on the distribution side, the you know the thermal network side. But I, I get uh, Rajesh, is is this a, maybe a question related to you know kind of the, the components in the absorbers themselves? I, I I'm not exactly sure. Um. I just want to clarify the question. So the question is, what is the right material of the uh, district well, heating? Well, what it says, the steel the only material you can use for heat district cooling. So I, I'm, I'm not, uh, so the questioner may want to circle back uh, directly. Um, so I, I don't know, it, it's a little hard for me to discern exactly what the uh, nature of the question is. So we'll, maybe we'll come back to that privately. Uh, okay. Next question was, uh, what's the expected downtime for a megawatt scale uh, absorption uh, mode? So the re reconfiguration to and from like chiller and heat pump. Um, you know, is there uh, some concern about uh, continuity, business interruption? Is that anything that uh, an operator should, should uh, kind of consider? Seasonal downtime or unscheduled downtime? Mm -hmm. First of all, it has to be clarified uh, upfront at the design stage that the unit is, uh, you know, the manufacturer needs to know that the unit will be designed to operate like a chiller during summertime and heat pump yeah. during the winter time. Yeah. As far as the changeover is concerned, it shouldn't take more than a day. Not okay. even a day, but I would say eight hours fine uh, to change out some walls, to change some settings, to check, and it's almost like a, a recommissioning kind of a thing. Uh, I see. Whether in, okay. Uh, whether in chiller mode or heat pump mode, uh, the unit is a you know very static piece of equipment. There is not much to do there other than uh, right. I, I have been a service guy for a long time, so I know that I we need to do only simple things. But those simple things can also go wrong sometimes. So maintenance right. of the vacuum, maintenance of the corrosion inhibitor, and maintenance of the water quality. These three things are very very important. Yeah. Uh, the seemingly, you know, simple things also sometimes are ignored, and then you start to have um, issues. So I would yeah. say maintain the vacuum, maintain the corrosion inhibitor, and maintain the water quality, and there is really then not much to do. And is it would it be recommended then that let's let's say you're in the shoulder months, right, a seasonal sort of you know turnover. Uh, we're outside of Boston when it's March or April, you know, the the weather can vary, right? One day can be very hot, next day very cold. Is it, do you see like typical where uh, these larger units, they'll, they'll actually have like a seasonal switch over? They won't, they won't go back and forth, right? One day to the next or, or, or do they? Uh, no, they don't. Yeah. Yeah, it's really like a seasonal, you know, a defined date. As of April 15, we're going to cooling mode. Uh, before that, the unit is for heating. Yeah. And now there is a there is a variant of the unit. Um, it is called as the uh, there is a there is a unit uh, that is simultaneous chill water or hot water or chiller heater unit where. Uh, um. Uh, with not, I would not say that it is very common in New York City or maybe in Boston. So you operate the unit as a chiller or you operate the unit as a heater or a chiller heater. But yeah. when you switch from one mode to the other, you still need an hour, two hours to uh, manually change over some valves. Yes. It, yeah, it's not an instant just press one button type. Yes, it's, it's, it's not like uh, an outboard motor, right? You just sort of flip a switch and you can go in reverse, right? So, um, yeah, well, that makes sense. Next question, what's the minimum working steam pressure on the steam turbine centrifugal chiller? What, what would you say the minimum uh, working pressure would be on a steam turbine drive? Okay, by that, I think I, I'm assuming that the uh, question uh, is that what is the minimum supply steam pressure to make a steam turbine chiller work. Yes, that would that be my guess too. Right, right. So in that case, it would be, the answer would be around 30 PSIG. Okay. So you need a, a 30 PSIG. Uh, is no. that, that's the minimum supply pressure or the differential pressure? Uh, no, that is the supply pressure. Now, okay. <clears throat> we are talking about steam turbine that is part of the chiller package, mounted on the chiller package, but 
if the steam turbine i haven't really seen a steam turbine chiller application below 30 pound steam pressure but i guess if it is lower than that can be done as long as the steam steam turbine itself can be floor mounted what happens when the steam pressure goes low uh, basically your uh, inlet uh, nozzle diameter for that steam inlet goes higher and higher and higher to a point where you cannot mount the steam turbine on the top of the unit so it as long as side side mounted floor mounted is acceptable can be done okay but, but i would say i would say i would say 30 pounds is better 30 pounds and, and uh so i work for the hartford steam company we had 20 that well 18000 tons of steam turbine drive chillers you know i think the sweet spot for them was like 125 psig right i mean that these were That's you know fairly big units from 5,000 down to 2,000 tons. Um, Absolutely. Right. Um, next question, and, and we're going to have to conclude in a, in a few minutes, but uh, can, so can Rajesh speak about the energy efficiency and cost advantage of CHP plus absor absorption chillers, like a hybrid system compared to more of a conventional all-electric chiller gas boiler configuration? I mean, that, that could probably, you could probably use an hour to do that, but are there, you know, kind of some rules of thumb that you would suggest CHP plus absorber? Mm. I mean, it all depends on the spark spread. Uh, that is the first thing. What is the cost of electricity and demand charges versus cost of gas? Right. That's what I would suggest, too, really. It's the, it's the demand charge and the differential, right? The ability to avoid the demand charge, right? So, like you mentioned, one configuration, Rajesh, where the steam uh, the steam absorbers are the primary supply, uh, and no, 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 I have it backwards. The electric chillers are the primary supply. The notion being, once you start them during a demand month, you want to run them, right? You don't want to be starting and stopping and incurring demand charge. Um, but so I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but it really is not just a function of the equipment, the hybrid layout. It's it's also in what kind of electric tariff are you operating? Yeah. So uh, and what's the price of your heat, right? Exactly. Uh, there are many different situations. In many cases, I've seen that um, it is uh, it, it is common to use gas-fired boilers to drive steam because in those places either electricity is very expensive or electricity is unreliable or not available at all. A customer right. wants to expand uh, his production capacity in, let's say, a plastic factory, but he doesn't get the necessary amount of megawatts that he's looking for. So then the only option is to fire natural gas to produce heat to drive the absorption. But uh, on the CHP front, what my personal experience has been that um, Anytime you have low cost of electricity, like six to eight cents a kilowatt hour, uh, yeah. CHP becomes difficult to justify. But yeah. anything above, yeah, anything above nine, ten cents a kilowatt hour, and even if the demand charges are not that significant, CHP would uh, make a sense considering current cost of natural gas, assuming let's say, uh, you know, five dollars a million BTU. Right. Um, and one of the questions uh, we, we also had, Rajesh, is when the payback time is mentioned, are you talking about direct costs? Because you mentioned some of, in some of these applications, you know, paybacks of a year or less. Um, was that, uh, or did that include indirect costs, uh, like carbon price, uh, other externalities? Uh, or was that really sort of, you know, direct costs of avoiding primary energy use? No, uh, it, it was direct costs. Direct costs. Okay. And I did not, yeah, I did not even include the water savings. Very good. Uh, one of the last questions I think we have, have you seen any application of absorption chillers in end user buildings, for example, like an office building that's driven by hot water or steam uh, from a district loop? So in other words, the building um, is, using, is, is using piped in district heating uh, for the, and then using that to make cooling. Very, very common. Very common. Right. Uh, uh, I've seen this uh, in Europe a lot. Uh, I was giving right. an example at the microgrid conference a few days ago uh, in Frankfurt or let's say, right. uh, you know, a major concert hall in uh, northeast of Germany. So the uh, local utility is um, selling the hot water. And so because they are in the business of selling hot water, they want to uh, pipe as much less flow as possible through that pipeline and have a huge delta T. 
Um, right. Oh, uh, right. So mm -hmm, it is very common to take the municipal hot water and uh, drive an absorber. It's not right. so much common here in the U.S., but I think uh, uh, it's, it's done very successfully. Yeah, I, I think there's a, well, in Manhattan, from time to time, there have been hundreds of thousands of tons of steam turbine drive uh, chillers. And I know that absorbers are making a, a, a comeback, too, in Manhattan, where, and there's also both uh, 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 capital support from NYSERDA, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for heat-driven chilling application to, to kind of take load off the wires, uh, and, uh and there's really sort of, you know, a lot of excess summer steam, too. So uh, in the past, there have been some preferential rates uh, as well. So Manhattan has quite a bit, and, uh, you know, and there are quite a bit of applications, uh, district heating providing uh, in-building cooling. Um, one last question, I think, how many pounds of 150-pound steam per ton of chilling for the 1,250-ton unit? Are they using about eight pounds per ton or so? Yeah, approximately eight to eight and a half. Right. Uh, I just want to go back to your earlier point about uh, NYSERDA. So in New York City, yes. uh, uh, last calendar year, I believe the rebate was almost $500 a ton, but this year they changed it and made it more attractive. Uh, I believe the rebate is now $1,600 for every kilowatt avoided from the grid. Wow. Yeah. So wow, obviously the uh, that, motivation of uh-huh. Obviously that, the motivation that'll pay of the for a lot of steel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um last question, uh and I know you wanted to conclude at uh two fifteen. Can you comment on the reliability maintenance requires of absorption chillers? Have you uh you know the the, the commenter is talking about I think what is, you know, kind of a uh, historical, like he calls it a bad rep. Have, have the units improved? Or are they, you know, more durable, reliable? Yeah, so as much as there are great stories about absorbers in North America, there are also not so great stories about absorbers in North America. Outside of North America, the world is totally different. Uh, I'm right. just being blunt here. I mean, we never come across this question in Europe or other parts of the world. Uh, but right. in North America, the, the, the person who asked this question is absolutely right. Um, you know, you got, um, uh, I mean, this technology is different. It operates in the vacuum and it is more, uh, you know, a thorough understanding of the chemistry and how it works is important. What has happened over the years, uh, you know, the, the most common problem faced by people in the U.S. market was crystallization on a two-stage chiller. Yeah, I see. So some manufacturers... Uh, have uh, uh, taken the technology to a new level where I would say that, let's say I can speak on behalf of my design because I don't know the other people's design from inside. I would say that our philosophy is that operate or design the chiller with the lowest possible lithium bromide salt concentration. So design the unit with less salt and more water. When you got less salt, more water, that means that solution is easier to boil. Easier to boil means lower pressure, lower temperature, and therefore lower corrosion, lower chances of crystallization to a point where I can tell you that, you know, our um, our philosophy is to maintain a very high distance from that danger crystallization zone to a point where we actually can avoid crystallization by design rather than, you know, a lot of people brag about sophisticated controls and high-tech control panel, but the best way to improve reliability avoiding corrosion crystallization is to inbuild the unit with a design that has less salt, more water. That is the best way. Right. And final question. Um, uh, sorry. If you can operate the turbine chiller as low as 30 PSIG, what, what, what would be the benefit of using a turbine drive chiller over a steam absorber? Is it, is it in the load variance, turn down, uh, performance? Uh, you know, if, if you, what, what would you suggest at the low range of, uh, of uh, steam pressure? I, I would say that uh, if you got only 30 pounds, uh, just keep it simple and go with a single stage steam absorption chiller. But, right. But there are applications where, uh, let's say, the customer may want some flexibility in terms of a parallel electric drive. So the unit operates like a steam turbine chiller, but during shoulder months, you may want to operate it as an electric chiller. That is one uh -huh. 
Right, and the other way is that the other other reason for using steam centrifugal for low pressure steam is that uh, let's say you've got more than three more more than two thousand tons of cooling requirement because typically absorption chillers you know about fifteen hundred tons uh, they will start to be shipped in multiple pieces. You don't want to kind of then get into reassembly at the job site and all that as opposed to steam turbine chiller that can be shipped in one single piece as large as up to three thousand tons. So yeah. I see. Well, that, uh, that's a, that's an important consideration. I I think it really does. It probably also relate, relates to, uh, you know, your your prime mover, right? The the availability uh, of steam over a full load duration curve, right? What do you have eighty seven sixty, so you can kind of you know I guess optimize or match around that. Well, we've taken um, we we we've, we've gone right to two fifteen, and Rajesh, I want to thank you for. Uh, really excellent content. I want to thank all of our participants for uh, staying on the line. I invite you to join us for future webinars. In fact, we're going to take an, another dive uh, into absorption technology, uh, absorption 101 on November 15th, and you can register. It's free, um, and uh, hope you'll consider joining us and relaying this to your colleagues. Uh, finally, if we could ask, uh, when the web webinar closes, you will all receive a, a brief survey. should only take you a minute. We'd appreciate your feedback so that we stay uh, headed in the right direction and are providing the content that you're looking for. And finally, Rajesh, uh, thank you very much. I, you know, I, you, you've really uh, you've taught me a lot. Um, uh, I, I know who I'm going to go to when I have a, a question on absorbers and and using heat, and uh, uh, thank you very much for making this a very meaningful and educational segment. So thanks. Thank you, Rob. Any thank last, you, uh, any last comments from you, Rajesh? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Thank you, IDA. And more importantly, thank you uh, for everyone uh, on the phone for joining us today. Thank you so much. And, and if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, uh, these, uh, these locations. B dash chiller solutions marketing at JCI, and then the website is uh, york.com absorption chillers uh, for additional information. And uh, look for your email, you'll be receiving the link to the streaming content as well as access to the slides that have been presented today. Uh, thank you all, and uh, I hope to see you either in Dubai or New Orleans uh, at, at a future IDA conference. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye.